Hello, I'm Alan Payne, and I've recently retired from Dismet Balestra. This is a slightly edited version of a talk that I gave to the meeting in Sydney, Australia, back in the far off days of February, when international travel was a perfectly normal thing to do. In any system, such as a vegetable oil processing plant, whatever enters it must be equal to whatever leaves it, plus or minus any accumulation inside. But when I said that I was thinking of doing a talk on how to make accurate mass balances in vegetable oil refineries, an old hand in the industry said to me that it couldn't be done, and he was not entirely wrong. Even the nuclear reprocessing industry isn't able to keep track of all the plutonium that they handle, even though it's one of the most dangerous and expensive materials known to humankind. But more of that later. Here is the result of a performance test that we did in a soybean oil refinery. 0.8% of the oil loss was unaccounted for, and on average it seems difficult to balance all the flows in a refinery to better than 0.5%. If we had a better idea of where the oil was going, we might be able to do more to control the losses and improve profitability. In this talk, we shall look at the various ways that errors can occur in vegetable oil refinery mass balances, and also take a look at some broader issues to do with measurement in science and industry. It's important to remember that what we often call losses consists of two types of material. There is the stuff that we have to get rid of in order to purify the oil, but at the same time there's always a certain amount of oil that we would prefer to keep in the product that is drawn away into the side streams. If 100 tonnes of oil contains 2% of materials such as gums, fatty acids and other impurities, then we have to remove 2 tonnes just to get the oil into a saleable condition, and we cannot reduce that figure. But during this separation, some good oil that we would have liked to have kept ends up in the side streams, shown as X in the picture. This is the real loss that we can try to do something about. If we can accurately measure this loss in the different places that it occurs, then we can see the effects of tuning the process to try and reduce it to as close as zero as possible. In some areas of science, it's possible to make measurements much more accurately than most of us are used to. Albert Michelson spent a large part of his life measuring the speed of light. Probably his best known result published in 1927 involved reflecting light through a series of mirrors from Mount Wilson Observatory in California to Mount San Antonio, 35 kilometers away and back. Without the benefit of electronic timing, his final result was just over one part in a hundred thousand of a currently accepted figure. Now Michelson had two advantages over us. Firstly, the speed of light is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow whereas we are trying to measure things that are constantly changing. Secondly, Michelson et al. were able to spend years perfecting their experimental method. And this can be a lesson to us as well. We don't have to be as thorough as Michelson, but if we go out into the factory just on one day and try to take a series of measurements, we shouldn't be too surprised if we don't get a fully consistent picture. If we look for sources of error and repeat the same investigation, then it should be possible to improve the long-term accuracy of our results. As I indicated already, I would like to look at an example in the nuclear industry. In a nuclear reactor, neutrons arising from the fission of uranium-235 bombard uranium-238 and turn some of it into plutonium. The plutonium is recovered from the spent nuclear fuel and then used as fuel itself. In 2005, news emerged that the UK Atomic Energy Authority had lost 30 kilograms of plutonium in an audit of the previous year's production. This may not sound very much, but the bomb that sadly destroyed Nagasaki in 1945 contained only 6 kilograms, so the initial reaction of some sectors of the press was to wonder if it had been stolen by terrorists. Fortunately, it quickly emerged that 30 kilograms was the discrepancy between the amount of plutonium received in spent fuel rods and the amount in new fuel rods and various side streams. 
It wasn't a case of 30 kilograms of plutonium on a shelf somewhere that had suddenly disappeared. The company explained that the discrepancy only amounted to about one part in a thousand or 0.1% of the tons of plutonium that they had handled. Now, if the highly regulated nuclear industry cannot always reconcile all the flows in and out of their plants to less than 0.1%, then it will probably be difficult for our industry to match it, even though the value of 0.1% of the oil produced by a thousand ton a day plant is worth hundreds of thousands of US dollars per year. As I've already said in a short trial, it only seems possible to balance all the flows in a vegetable oil refinery to about 0.5% on average. So what are the causes of these apparent losses and how can we better understand what is happening? In many refineries, the removal of gums and free fatty acids in a chemical neutralizing line accounts for a large percentage of a loss of good oil that we would like to keep. Acid is added to the oil to make phospholipids, also known as phosphatides or gums, easier to remove. And sodium hydroxide is used to turn free fatty acid into soap. Soap, acidulated gums and other material form soap stock, which is separated from the oil by a set of inclined spinning discs in a centrifugal separator. But no matter how good the separator is, some oil is drawn into the soap stock. Solids in the oil accumulate in the sludge chamber, which is periodically opened. Sludge and soap stock join together in the soap stock tank, but the sample point normally only allows you to sample the soap stock. High accuracy flow meters are sometimes used to measure the flow in and out of a separator and determine the amount of soap stock produced. It's a useful indication of short term variations and you can get an instantaneous reading of a soap stock flow but you have to totalize the flow for over an hour or more to get a good idea of the total loss, including the sludge discharge. If the flow meters have an accuracy of plus or minus 0.1%, which is fairly typical, then the overall measurement could be out by up to 0.2%. Okay for daily monitoring, but we need to do better than this if we want to balance the flows to within one part in a thousand. Instead of trying to measure the difference between the oil entering and leaving the separator, you could continuously measure the amount of soap stock and sludge produced. Mounting the soap stock tank on load cells or installing a totalizing flow meter on the discharge pump would give an accurate measure of a combined amount of soap stock and sludge. The great thing is that if you only measure the soap stock flow to within 1%, then in this example, you would have measured the difference in oil flow to within 0.04%, which is five times more accurate than measuring the oil flow with meters accurate to 0.1%. It is common to discharge sludge three or four times an hour, and this can amount to at least 0.2% of the oil flow. Every time it happens, the balance of a separator is upset. If you delay the sludge discharge, the refined oil becomes more cloudy. Passing the oil and the reagents through a hydrodynamic cavitation or nanoreactor reduces losses, gives a cleaner separation between the phases and also allows a longer period between desludging. If you have weighed and monitored the flow of everything and you are still not sure whether you have a good result or not, there's fortunately another way to study the performance of the refining separator. I'm indebted to Gerardo de la Piedra for alerting me to the sodium balance method by Kra and Sullivan, which presented at the fall meeting of the AOCS in 1960 and published in the JAOCS in April 1961. So it's definitely time to give it another airing. Gerardo has used this method to monitor the losses at Alicorp in Peru. I won't go into all the details, but the method relies on measuring the sodium content of the three main streams and the percentage treat, which is the flow of caustic soda solution compared with the flow of the oil. But the neat thing is you do not need any flow rate data. The percentage treat can be determined by titration with a pH meter. So what we have here is a way of double checking any calculation 
based on flow rate and or weight measurements. A simple formula calculates refining loss, which is the difference in oil flow between the inlet and outlet of a separator. The paper showed that the difference between the refining loss calculated by weighing and calculated by sodium balance was between 0 and 0.2%. To fully account for the sludge, you would have to take several samples throughout the operating cycle and combine them together. One more thing to consider is water. Water is sometimes added to soap stock to make it easier to flow, and the oil at the exit of separators usually contains more water than the unrefined oil, so this has to be taken into account when making a full mass balance. Oil at the exit of the first separator can still contain a significant amount of soap, which can be removed by mixing the oil with hot water and then performing a second separation. The losses are much less than those in the soap stock separator and can be easily calculated from flow and composition data. In bleaching, oil is mixed with powdered clay, often called bleaching earth, to remove colour and other impurities. The clay or earth is then separated from the oil in a filter. When the filter is full, the oil is blown out of the vessel and steam passes through the cake to dry it removing as much residual oil as possible before it is dropped into a container. Sampling the filter cake is not always easy and you have to find a way to get the sample making sure that the next batch isn't about to fall on your head. The removal of oil from the base of the filter is never absolutely perfect so at least a small amount of oil falls out every time the discharge valve is opened and can collect at the bottom of the container. The cake may not have dried evenly, so a single sample may not be fully representative. Probably the best you can do is to take several samples from different parts of the container, including some from as far below the surface as you can get, and then combine them together. The amount of oil in the cake can be measured by extracting a sample with hexane. A typical figure would be 24% oil in cake, but this doesn't mean that you have 24 kilograms of oil to every 100 kilograms of bleaching earth used. The oil is part of a cake which adds to its weight, so we need about 32 kilograms of oil per 100 kilograms of bleaching earth to get 24% oil in cake, even if nothing else is present. Of course, bleaching always removes impurities that we do not want in the oil such as colour and oxidised material. If it didn't, then it wouldn't be very useful. But the effect of the impurities on the loss calculation is sometimes overlooked. The net result of this is that the amount of impurities and good oil lost can add up to about 50% of the original weight of the earth. Also, any change in the moisture content of the earth has to be taken into account as well to reach an accurate result. It is also possible for oil to be lost in the vacuum set and in the system for recovering oil from the steam used to blow the cake. In modern bleachers, these losses are very small, but in older plants, they could be significant. In a deodorizer, free fatty acid and other volatile materials are removed by injecting steam into oil at high temperature and low pressure. The triglyceride, which makes up most of the oil, has almost zero vapor pressure and is not evaporated in the deodorizer, but some oil is entrained as droplets, which are then carried through into the scrubber. The scrubber condenses the volatile material, which carries with it the entrained droplets of oil. In this design, the baffles above the deodorizing tray and the vertical section in the vapor pipe help to keep down the amount of entrained oil reaching the scrubber. The flow of distillate can vary between about 0.3 and 6% or more of the oil flow and can be measured by a totalizing flow meter and or a calibrated tank. As we saw with refining separators, it's more accurate to measure the amount of distillate produced than try to measure the difference between the oil flow at the entrance and exit of the deodorizer. The amount of oil loss is often estimated by measuring the acidity of a distillate. This is a useful test for daily monitoring 
and will quickly show if there has been a dramatic change inside the deodorizer, but it's not accurate enough to make detailed mass balances. In any investigation, we have to be careful to avoid interpreting data in ways that confirm our preconceptions. It's often said that glass is not a solid, but a supercooled liquid. So when it was discovered that very old panes of glass were often thicker at the bottom than at the top, this was seen as evidence that over the centuries the glass had slowly flowed down to the bottom of the frame. But then a more prosaic explanation emerged that medieval glassmakers could not easily make perfectly flat sheets of glass as we can today, so they used to install the glass with the thicker end at the bottom. Of course this is just a fun example but whether you're involved in edible oil refining or something else that involves making observations and drawing conclusions from them, then you always need to be on your guard against making false assumptions that could allow your expectations to bring you the result that you expect. Here's something a bit close to home, illustrating that even an accurate reading can give a misleading impression. The scrubbed vapour from a deodorizer passes to a vacuum system that maintains a pressure usually of a few millibar inside a deodorizer. In a vacuum set consisting of steam jet ejectors and condensers there's always a maximum water temperature above which the system doesn't work. At one startup I was at the cooling tower fan was being controlled to save electricity. A temperature indicator at the entrance of the condenser showed a constant temperature but the deodorizer pressure was fluctuating up and down on a regular cycle. We struggled with this for some time before I had the idea of checking the water temperature by holding a laboratory thermometer in the water at the bottom of the cooling tower. What I found was that the water temperature was going up and down as the controller turned the cooling tower fan on and off. So the water temperature was periodically rising above the upper limit and the vacuum was failing. The dial thermometer was accurately measuring the average water temperature, but instead of fluctuating, the reading remained steady because the sensing element was a bimetallic strip. It responded much more slowly than the liquid in glass thermometer, which emphasizes what my science teacher said about how you should always record the method used to make a measurement, not just what the reading was. In conclusion, we have seen that it is difficult to reconcile the overall oil loss in a vegetable oil refinery with the oil lost in all the side streams. Even the nuclear reprocessing industry cannot perfectly account for all the plutonium that they handle. But this doesn't mean we can't do better. Neutralising is an area where high losses can occur and it's difficult to study. But we can improve the accuracy of our results by repeating the same investigation a number of times so that errors are progressively eliminated. Like Michelson measuring the speed of light, we shouldn't expect to get the best possible result the first time. Errors can arise because of unrepresentative samples. Solids such as bleacher filter cake and soap stock are especially prone to fluctuations in composition. So it's important to combine multiple samples to get the most accurate results. We must also be on our guard against coming to biased conclusions that confirm what we expected to see. And as we saw with the fluctuating vacuum, it's even possible for an effectively accurate result to lead us in the wrong direction. In a busy refinery, the focus has to be on making sure that the plant is operating and customers are receiving their orders. It's not always practical on a regular basis to minutely examine every side stream to see how much oil is in it. But if we can improve our knowledge of where losses are occurring and use that knowledge to improve productivity, even by a very small amount, then it's definitely worth doing. Thank you.